uh, holding that seat for the Labour Party by about 223 votes. So let's speak to Jason Reid now, who's a political commentator and has been, been uh, watching, like many others, Batley and Spen really closely. Jason, hi there. Hi, Daryl. Great to be with you. Thank you, mate. Nice to um, nice to have you on. Um, I'm 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 looking at this this election, this by election, Jason, and and we know that politics is divisive. We know that politics is heated. It's full of emotion. There's nothing really wrong with that. It's fine to have emotion in politics. In fact, it's important to have emotion in politics. But I'm I'm looking at what happened here, particularly in the context of of Joe Cox's murder six years ago, Jason, and I, and I'm wondering if we have ever seen anything quite as toxic and divisive as what happened in Batley and Spen. <clears throat> Quite possibly not. This was always going to be a, a very toxic and a very difficult and sensitive uh, by-election. If you compare it, for example, to another recent by-election in Chesham and Amersham, which in political terms was just as big an upset, swinging to the, the Lib Dems away from the Conservatives, but the main issues there were to do with transport, HS2, and to do with house building. In contrast to that, in Batley and Spen, we have, as you say, we're, um, that constituency is very much still in the in the long shadow left by Joe Cox's murder, and um, of course, free speech was a very important issue. Um, lots of voters were bringing up the importance of Palestine. It was a very, very difficult by-election to to be involved with and to watch because so many of these issues um, hit so close to home for so many people. Um, a, a narrow win for for Kim uh, for Kim led uh, led Peter Jason, but uh, a big win for Keir Starmer in terms of what it means for him being able to hold on to his position uh, to, to, to put at bay some of those people who were circling around him? Yeah, very much so. It's a big relief for the leader of the opposition's office. Uh, expectations were very, very low for Labour in this election. I think most people thought that the Tories were going to take it. And potentially that's uh, part of the reason why Labour were able to nab it by such a small margin in the end, because potentially there was some complacency in the Tory campaign in the final days um, which led to those few hundred votes slipping away. There were reports uh, on the morning of uh, polling day that the get out the vote campaign from uh, from the Tory activists was not as successful as they'd wanted it to be. And for Keir Starmer that's a huge relief. It means that people like Dawn Butler who reportedly were, um, challenged, were looking to set up challenges to his leadership have had to row back and uh, we had Diane Abbott saying today that she would never do to Keir Starmer what the right of the party did to Jeremy Corbyn, which is a, a big change of tone um, and is exactly what Keir Starmer needed to shore up his leadership for now, anyway. Sure. Um, Jason, give, give me, I, I know you're sort of politically uh, 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 right of centre, I think that's un unfair to say. Give me a, give me a, 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 a sort of objective uh, a, a, a conclusion as you can, or an assessment as you can, of what Keir Starmer does next? How does he capitalise on this moment of momentum? Well, it, it's very important that he does capitalise on it because uh, this is protect, perhaps the first moment he's had in his leadership of the Labour Party, certainly in, in recent memory, that he is in the driving seat and he feels like he can start to make gains. He's obviously been on a mission so far to reinvent the Labour Party, to um, erase the memory of uh, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and to make Labour seem patriotic. What always stands out for me is the uh, front, co front cover of the, the Daily Telegraph featuring the leader of the Labour Party on BE Day, which was quite something. Mm. He, he wants to make Labour the party of Britain. He wants to reach out to people who Labour haven't had support from for decades now. And uh, this is the perfect opportunity for him to do that, for him to present this sensible middle of the road alternative, which re rejects on the one hand the divisive politics of uh, the likes of George Galloway and rejects, on the other hand, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Tory status quo. That's really interesting. And I also wonder if there is something here about uh, that will buoy him, perhaps, Jason, that that that, that Tory march in places like uh, Yorkshire and uh, the North East and uh, in some some areas of the North West hasn't happened here in the same way that it did in Hartlepool. And perhaps it's a bit of a two fingers to people like me, Jason, who like to talk. I mean, I'm from Manchester, right? I live in Salford. I'm, I grew up in Bolton. Uh, you know, I'm from the Red Wall. I live in the Red Wall. Uh, but, you know, but and, and I, I know how uh, ridiculous it is to apply stereotype uh, to people like me. But I wonder if this is a bit of a a bit of a two fingers to people like me who do like to do that, who do constantly like to point at the, at the Red Wall and discuss it as one big homogenous group. It certainly is a bit of a spanner in the works for people. I mean, I think I'm just as guilty of it as you are. It's convenient to have those narratives where you can just say, 
all of the North is now going to Labour and all of the South is now going to the Conservatives. And that's all you need to know about the realignment of British politics. And uh, Batley and Spen, the voters of Batley and Spen, obviously made it clear that they didn't want to be part of that narrative, that they weren't just going to mindlessly switch to supporting Boris and supporting the party that's been in government for, what is it, 11 years now. Um, and so they've uh, they've stuck with the Labour candidate and they've made their position quite clear. And it is, it is a, very much a spanner in the works of the fall of the Red Wall as a whole. You would expect that Batley and Spen will be one of the top target seats now for the Conservatives when it comes to the next general election, because they came so close to winning at this time. And there'll be a lot of questions asked in number 10 and in government about why they didn't manage to get this over the line. Oh, but they'll also presumably, though, Jess, and look at the, the, the share of the vote that George Galloway got, which was far and away uh, more than, than, than was anticipated, actually. A lot of people suggested he might maven uh, lose his deposit, but he did uh, He did very well, securing 20% of the vote. You throw a couple of, a couple of thousand uh, back to the Labour Party. You know, George Galloway is one entity. He can't be replicated, really, across lots of constituencies. So if it comes round to a general election you, you would have to assume that that sort of George Galloway effect that we're talking about with Batley and Spen won't necessarily be as present and if you throw a, f a couple of thousand of those votes back to the Labour Party it looks like a, a much more conclusive win now you're going to get a bigger turnout and things shift around uh, in general elections in, in all sorts of different ways but but is this also one of those moments that Boris Johnson will, will look at and think well perhaps I'm not as electorally sound uh, and, and undefeatable, you know, or, or, you know, completely and utterly on march as I thought I was. Definitely, yes. Uh, Batley and Spen is a very interesting constituency in this sense, because they've always had a very big independent vote. Of course, in the past, it wasn't George Galloway. It was uh, Paul Halloran with the uh, Woolen Independence, I think the party is called. And they um, they always get a sizable proportion of the votes. In 2019, they got about 10, 11 percent. But George Galloway, as you say, far exceeded expectations. He got almost double what Paul Halloran got two years ago. Um, and uh, he, he's promoting a brand of politics that is very, very different to anything that's an offer from the main two parties. And as you say, it's it's because the numbers are so tight, you only have to take a few votes away from him and give them to someone else. And you've got a completely different political picture and you can draw a completely different narrative from it. There are various other very small marginal um, things like that that happened in this by-election, which could have swung the result. For example, the Green Party, ended up not fielding a candidate, mm. um, which, because the Labour margin was so small, perhaps if the Green Party had fielded a candidate and got just a few hundred votes, that could have uh, made it a Tory, um, a Tory victory, which, of course, would have uh, strengthened the narrative, which we would have heard, I'm sure, a lot today from government ministers about how this is another mm. brick in the red wall that's fallen. It, it, this is a really interesting point you make there, Jason, because... We're talking here about an electoral coalition, really, that's fallen behind Labour in the same way that an electoral coalition fell behind the Lib Dems in the by-election in, uh, in in Cheshire Maven. So, and so and I just wonder if there are two by-elections here in quick succession that have been won by the Lib Dems on one hand and Labour on the other with... Um, with with an electoral sort of a sort of an electoral alliance, if you will, a progressive alliance, I think is the way that they describe it, Jess. And and and, and the Labour leader Keir Starmer will be looking at that and thinking maybe that's his best route into number ten. Quite possibly, yes. This is something that um, smaller parties like the Lib Dems and the Greens have been pushing for for a long time, for obvious reasons, because they want to increase the power that they have within British politics, and they want to make them make themselves disproportionately influential. Um, and it's certainly been. Uh, um, a good counter argument to the uh, the proposition that people the tactical voting like that doesn't work because people don't engage with it and people are loyal and stick to their party. These last couple of years of by elections have shown that people are very very willing and able to um, disregard national politics in favour of local politics and and do what needs to be done in order to make the numbers work. It was amazing to see some of uh, Kim Ledbetter's posters that she put up during her campaign didn't mention the Labour Party at all. If you didn't know who she was, you might not have known that she was the Labour candidate. They weren't even red. Um, they weren't even red in terms of the, the Labour colour. So um, there is certainly a, a growing momentum behind this idea of a progressive alliance. And it's something that might, the conversation around that might become a lot louder as we edge towards the next general election. And it's, it becomes harder and harder then for Keir Starmer to ignore that idea. It, it, it does in a sense, doesn't it, Jason? But but if we're talking tonight about, about what Keir Starmer does next, right? And, and, and what how he plays his hand uh, now that he's got a couple more cards in his pack. And electoral pact is on the table. 
can he really honestly, can he really honestly reach for that as, as an option? Will he? Does he have the, the political will and perhaps even the support within Labour to do that? It's hard to say at this point because the ground is very much still uh, still settling after uh, after the Batley and Spen surprise result. But I think it's very possible. A lot can happen in the in the two or three years between now and the next general election. I think it's very possible that Keir Starmer will look at the numbers and everyone else in the Labour Party will look at the numbers and realise that this is the way to do it. In 2019, we had uh, similar conversations about the role of Nigel Farage's Brexit Party mm. and whether they were going to take uh, lots of votes away from the Conservatives and potentially stop the Conservatives getting a big enough majority, um, even though they wanted the same thing. They wanted to execute Brexit. And it's going to be very, very similar. And of course, the Tories got away with it with an 80 seat majority anyway, because the get Brexit done vote was so strong. But Keir Starmer might look at the numbers and he's quite a cautious politician anyway. He might think that uh, he's better, he'd better be on the safe side and get the Lib Dems and the Greens inside the tent rather than leave them outside okay jason really interesting really interesting it kicks off that conversation we're going to have tonight about what keir starmer does jason thank you so much for your time really appreciate it jason reed who is the founder of young voices uk political commentator uh, his take on batley and spen and 